Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Jessica Jackley. I'm Chief Impact Officer at Aspiration and a co-founder of Kiva.org. I'm excited to be your moderator for today's program. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series. We'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all our other programs possible. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Today, I'm excited to be talking to Jeffrey Sachs, the Quetelet Professor of Sustainable Development at Columbia University and author of the new book, The Ages of Globalization, Geography, Technology, and Institutions. Widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on economic development and the fight against poverty, Dr. Sachs has worked with students and leaders around the world on these important, important problems. In the ages of globalization, Dr. Sachs argues that today's most urgent problems from food security and racial equity to climate change are fundamentally global. He believes we can help find answers to our 21st century problems by looking at our past and how previous generations rose to confront their challenges. If you're watching along with us and have a question you'd like me to ask Dr. Sachs, please put it in the text chat on YouTube and I'll be asking them later in the program. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Jeff, how are you today? Hey, Jessica, how are you? It's, it's such a pleasure, such a joy to see you on the screen here and to get to have this conversation with you. Um, Likewise, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for yet again, another exceptional book. I found it to be both a quick read and an incredibly rich uh, text that reminded me of some really important truths as we look back over so much time in the history of the world, but also so many really fresh new ways of looking at things, so many new insights. I just, I loved it so much. So thank you on a personal right. note for that. While I knew this book would be intellectually very interesting, um, I was also pretty amazed at how personal it felt. Um, and not just because now I know to work a little harder on my victory garden and maybe to go get a horse, but <laughs> the things that we're dealing with today, right now, this strange moment in history, I mean, insight after insight felt relevant. So I, I want to go way back to the beginning, although I'm very excited to fast forward up until up to the moment that we're in right now, because I think there's so much that we can, each listener, each watcher today can learn. Um, let's go way back. You open the book by saying humanity has always been globalized. Um, tell us more about that. How can that be? And what did that look like 70,000 years ago? Yeah, thank you very much. The book is a, actually a very personal book for me also. Uh, it emerged out of some lectures that I gave uh, at Oxford a few years ago because I wanted to put together uh, thoughts, uh, ideas, and practices of, of mine over the past 40 years. I've been advising governments in different parts of the world and have always had a very strong sense since I've been doing that, which is now uh, 35 years of active advising governments that probably the single most important question that one asks from any position on the globe is, how do I fit in to the rest of the world? Uh, in other words, the challenge of being part of a global economy and society is really the common reference point for almost every country in the world and almost every challenge that's faced. And I didn't know that at the beginning of uh, my active advising work, which was back in 1985. It felt incredibly fresh and strange to me that there I was in La Paz, Bolivia, uh, in the middle of uh, the Andes. And Everything was really a reference to how Bolivia fit into a broader world. A few years after that, I found myself in Poland uh, in the midst of the 1989 revolution. And while there were many dramatic things looking inward in Poland, to be sure, almost everything about the revolution, even the way that it was defined by the uh, solidarity leaders as a return to Europe, was a geographic concern. And geography loomed very large. And then in Africa, where uh, you and I have had a lot of experience uh, in your great work uh, with Kiva and uh, in my work during the Millennium Development Goals, again, physical geography shaped economics and was determined uh, by the state of technology. 
could we fight AIDS? Could we fight malaria? How could uh, one address some of these very geographically specific challenges that were looming large in development? Well, all of this is to say it, it took me a long time to understand this interaction of geography, uh, technology, mm -hmm. and institutions in any single place and in our modern period. But then the more I thought about it, the more I learned about it, the more I realized this was a, an eternal part of uh, human history. Uh, if you go back to uh, some of my now favorites of uh, Aristotle's uh, ancient Greece or uh, other parts of the world at key moments of history, uh, it was similar considerations of the interactions of the geography. Uh, of uh, institutions and technology. So this was an attempt to uh, create a kind of uh, approach or schema to looking at these challenges and uh, with the help of putting a date on mm -hmm. critical periods of uh, human history, starting, as you say, with the original dispersal of uh, and, uh, of, uh, of modern humans, anatomically modern human beings, the us as our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, out of Africa, estimated to be about 70,000 years ago when the real migration took hold and spread to all the world. And when one looks from that first outward migration to today, it's been a story not only of a global settlement reaching all parts of the world, actually pretty quickly after the dispersal from Africa, but also a history of long distance interaction. We've been moving, trading, uh, exchanging ideas and technologies uh, for as long as humanity has uh, been across the world. And uh, my sense back in the 1980s, oh, we're watching the global economy take hold. Well, that uh, could have been a sense uh, throughout much of human history. Of course, things proceeded in a vastly uh, slower pace uh, before we had uh, instantaneous communication, but it did proceed. Uh, and that really is uh, the story that I'm telling uh, in, uh, in this book. And you tell it very well um, in, in a very entertaining way. I, as you know, my husband Reza, he says hello. Right. <laughs> and I, I, I've kept shoving the book over to him as I was reading it at night, saying, you gotta read this part. Um, and it led to some really interesting conversations about globalization. In particular, he pointed out a quote that I had remembered reading in one of his books before, but there's a, there's a definition of globalization, Roland Robertson's view as quote, a concept that refers both to the compression of the world and to the intensification of a consciousness of the world as a whole. Just to kind of start with a, a pretty light, maybe fun question, at least for me, I was thinking, you know, if it's about perspective and mindset, as much as it is about logistics and actual reality of moving things and people around and being entwined politically, intertwined politically, being more connected technologically, I wonder if you think, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn off my notifications. I'm a little newer at this particular computer. Um, I wonder if there is a period in time when people felt as connected. I know that we actually are instantaneous and we can be instantaneously connected with anyone anywhere in the world. But I wonder, is that, when do you think that happened first? Were there other cultures, other times when just like you said, maybe we've had similar thoughts about how things have been progressing again and again in a, in a, in a cyclical way over time. But when do you think that feeling that I am connected, my idea about myself uh, is set in this framework of feeling like I live in, we all live in one place. All of us human beings live on this one planet and everything we do can affect anybody else. When do you think that, that kind of way of looking at things emerged? I Whether think, it was uh, accurate or, or not. <laughs> yes, I think probably uh, that idea of uh, what the Greeks called the ecumen, uh, which is the human uh, settlement of uh, all of uh, space. They didn't know how far it would reach, uh, but that's an idea 
in Herodotus, uh, in uh, the fifth century BC, in the first histories, that there are peoples everywhere. There are peoples in Africa. There are peoples in Asia. Uh, there's us. Uh, of course, the uh, Herodotus is a, an amazing uh, amalgamation of uh, remarkable first history uh, mm -hmm. and also of uh, a lot of uh, the fantasies, uh, the stories, uh, the legends uh, that were told because uh, so little was known about even a uh, thousand or two thousand miles away. But the notion that there was a settled world, uh, not clear how large, uh, was an idea that certainly uh, dates uh, back more than two millennia in a very active way. Long distance trade is a reality, of course, by the time of the Roman Empire, trading with China, uh, not quite understanding what's on the other side, but histories of uh, uh, emissaries uh, traveling very long distances far uh, before Marco Polo uh, made his way to Cathay. Uh, we know that uh, there were ideas about an interconnected world. Uh, there were not uh, sharp, uh, clear understandings uh, of that world, but I think the next phenomenal breakthrough, of course, came with uh, what Adam Smith uh, called the two most significant events in the history of mankind. Uh, and I, I'll, I quote the, that uh, part of uh, Adam Smith's writing from The Wealth of Nations uh, here, mm -hmm. because it's such a striking, uh, remarkable mm -hmm. uh, excerpt of his writing. But for him, the two most significant uh, events in human history is Columbus's voyage to the Americas in 1492 and Vasco da Gama circling the Cape of Good Hope and making his way to Asia, uh, linking Europe with seaborne uh, navigation and then trade uh, at the end of the 15th century. This was completely mind-blowing, mm -hmm. uh, this sense that, first of all, there was a new world that was not in the Bible. How can that be? Uh, we thought we knew the whole world. We thought we understood uh, the world. And suddenly, there's a whole new world of exploration. That shock alone may have been the most dramatic opening of the human imagination for ages when that happened. Uh, it triggered one after another revolutions uh, of thought in science, uh, in humanities, uh, in religion, uh, in philosophy. Uh, it was shocking, but that was the time I think that uh, there was the sense of the world that we know now as really being an interconnected world. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, within a, a couple of decades of those voyages, basically every aspect of thinking went wild. I'm deeply attracted to the decade 500 years uh, ago uh, now, that uh, the decade of the 1510s and the 1520s, yeah. uh, completely revolutionary. Uh, it was uh, the uh, my favorite painting, uh, which is uh, Raphael's uh, School of Athens, uh, painted in uh, uh, in uh, his uh, stanzas uh, in uh, in the Vatican, uh, and uh, Thomas More's Utopia, showing uh, the idea of a, a new world opening up. Erasmus uh, showing uh, the new humanism, and Martin Luther. Uh, posting his 95 theses uh, on uh, the cathedral door in, in Wittenberg. Uh, add to that Machiavelli writing at the same time, uh, and the uh, first manuscripts of Copernicus's uh, heliocentric theory of the world. Basically, within a few years, there was such an upheaval of uh, thought, I think fundamentally because the whole world had opened up, and there was a printing press to carry these new ideas uh, all over uh, Europe uh, in, in an incredible explosion of writing and thinking. So that's a second clear moment. For me, a third clear moment that I would highlight is a remarkable essay of the remarkable philosopher Immanuel Kant 
1794 called Perpetual Peace. And Kant, this uh, great philosopher of modernity and of the Enlightenment, I did asked my the question. Then. There you go. <laughs> asked the question, yeah. what would it take to have global peace? Mm -hmm. And for me, that is yet another step of this self-realization. We are all in this together. What can we do to stop this fighting? And uh, Kant gives a remarkable answer about uh, a, a global society of republics, uh, uh, in effect, uh, really giving the first idea of a world united in republicanism through international trade and out of the hands of uh, the princes and the despots and the monarchs who send young men off to war. And soon after Kant was uh, uh, a similar conceptual uh, piece of uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, the inventor of utilitarianism, who basically uh, invented the idea of international law, uh, saying that we need a charter which guides global statecraft. Maybe the last uh, next stage that I would uh, say in your question about self-realization is the iconic picture taken from space of the small uh, blue planet uh, when we see Earth from outside for the first time. I think that is also uh, a completely mesmerizing and transformative moment, or at least it should be. Mm -hmm. Stare at it, look at it, and uh, if you think about Earth the same way again, uh, maybe you're missing something in the picture. We are on this little speck. It is fragile. Uh, of course, uh, some people dream of uh, going someplace else, but if we can't fix what's on our planet, uh, we're not going to do much better uh, trying to uh, cross uh, the cosmos for something better after we've wrecked this planet. Yeah, it's sobering. I mean, I've often wondered, I'll talk to people who have gone to the same places, maybe even for the same -ish amount of time, and come back with different takeaways, different realizations. And I I mean, something I'm a little bit obsessed with is what is the thing? And you have quote after quote, and I have all of my notes right here about, um, for example, okay, so for example, in the industrial age, you talk about how output per person um, in these 200 years, right? It, went, it grew 11, 11 X, and then poverty went from 90 to 10%. I mean, these amazing shifts, but yet we still have these, remnants, these lingering big problems in the world, and there are threats coming up. And I think about if only everyone thought this one thought or, or knew this piece of information or saw that beautiful picture of the earth or, you know, what would it look like? And, and I guess kind of paired with this, I'm not asking you to, you know, what's the, what's the answer? What's the big sweeping answer there, although I, maybe I'll get to it later. <laughs> um, but I guess I've been thinking a lot uh, as I've read, you know, you talk about human activity and output and you talk about, you could talk about output um, in this, it, and, and of course this is what economists do, right? You talk about it in this one general way, output, yes. <laughs> stuff we do. Exactly. And, then I, but, and I think, you know, is all output created equal? Of course, it's not. Isn't some output counterproductive in the end? In other words, doesn't it matter greatly what that that action is, that product, that service, whatever the output is, right? Whatever value we're creating. I learned in business school that value really usually means one thing or traditionally has, which is a bummer, um, trying to work on redefining that. But is, is the kind of output that's related to creating much more pollution or inequality, for example, obviously like it should, I, it seems like it should be counted differently than output that leads to greater wellness for people and planet. Um, can you talk to me just a little bit about that? A little bit about how we think about what's, what we measure, how we measure it, what's worth measuring. I know these are big questions, but I want to ask you all the big, Absolutely. Questions, the big kind of cheesy. What's it all mean? Questions. Right. So <laughs> I see the numbers and I understand, but I, I want to, I wonder what will allow people to, I, what will allow all of us to sort of continue to evolve and wake up to these bigger truths and to the opportunity that we have? When I uh, look at the dates of uh, these ages of globalization, uh, after this first dispersal, the next uh, fundamental change of uh, human life is uh, 
uh, sedentary life as farmers, uh, the Neolithic revolution, the, the birth of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. And then I talk about another major technological breakthrough, uh, basically uh, the automobile age of uh, 3000 BC with the domestication of the horse and how mm -hmm. fundamental the horse was in changing everything about scale of human activity, uh, productivity, transport, communication, obviously, and all the rest, uh, how that gave way to uh, the large uh, empires that uh, we regard as the iconic empires, the Roman Empire, the Han Empire, uh, and so forth. And then uh, the breakthroughs that I just mentioned of uh, the ocean age, uh, the discovery of the sea routes, the fact that with ocean-based navigation, uh, you can move uh, goods and people, including, alas, slaves, uh, but people at uh, very low cost compared to uh, the costs of uh, moving uh, goods and services and people over land. And suddenly there was a worldwide economy taking shape. So one can consider uh, the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s to be the birth of the modern capitalist integrated world. And I emphasize it's not that pleasant a picture uh, because uh, it was occasioned as in many of these transitions uh, with incredible violence uh, and uh, in, in incredible uh, uh, view by the conquering societies of their God-given and innate superiority and therefore their God-given rights to plunder, to kill, uh, to uh, destroy other civilizations, to uh, create genocides, to enslave, uh, and so on. Uh, the period you're referring to is the sixth of the seven ages of globalization. It's the birth of the Industrial Age, which even more than the other uh, periods, uh, is really the remarkable fruits of one huge breakthrough, uh, and that is the steam engine, mm -hmm. which suddenly enabled uh, humanity to mobilize energy, uh, and specifically fossil fuel energy, coal, oil, and natural gas, on a scale that was simply uh, literally in every way beyond uh, imagining and beyond possibilities beforehand. So economic historians distinguish between the organic economy, which is basically what we can make with our hands or with animal power, and with wind in sails and wind in mills and water in water mills. But that adds a, a little bit. It doesn't change that much. And what could be done in the steam age, which then became the age of the internal combustion engine uh, and uh, the age of the gas turbine. So there is a breakthrough that took us in 200 years from almost everywhere living at near subsistence, almost everywhere living still uh, in uh, rural communities, something hard for us to think about because we, if we're lucky to visit Paris or uh, Beijing or Rome, you think uh, that civilization is... Uh, Urbanity, it's, it's uh, great cities uh, and great cities of the past. But in fact, only 10% uh, or much fewer uh, or much less of the world population lived in cities up until the industrial age. And countries that urbanized early, like the Netherlands and the UK, were extraordinary outliers. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, the, that uh, the UK got to industrialization first also made that little island uh, of Britain uh, take over the world because it uh, got to uh, industrial scale power ahead of uh, its near rivals, uh, in fact. So all of this is to say there was a deep transformation in every aspect of life that we need to understand is only around two centuries old uh, that took global society from essentially pervasive uh, and seemingly perpetual uh, subsistence or poverty mm -hmm. to our current state on average of global wealth and to a remarkable 
decline in extreme deprivation from what was near universal, maybe 80 to 90 percent of the world population, down to something less than 10 percent today, and in a context in which the world population increased tenfold. Quite remarkable. And it was as late as 1798 that Robert Thomas Malthus was writing in his work, The Principles of Population, that we would never escape from poverty because we could never keep ahead of the rise of population that would drive living standards back down to subsistence. But here, as Malthus said, uh, the rise of productivity did spur a tenfold rise of global population. But on top of that was a hundredfold, roughly, increase of output, meaning 10 times per person by the end of this period. Now, the question you pose, what does that all mean in terms of well-being, is actually something I was writing exactly today. Uh, that uh, what may have made sense philosophically, uh, and I'm, I'm writing a little bit about the philosophy of economics right now, what may have made sense philosophically in 1776, when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, mm-hmm. that wealth would be the goal, made sense in a world of scarcity. Sure. But now we are in a world of wealth. You could say by the way, with the incredible crimes along the way, with incredible suffering along the way, with incredible inequality along the way, and still with this striking, uh, shocking, completely unnecessary fact that there still is 10% of the world's population with extreme deprivation and no reason for that at all, as you know well, and uh, as I've seen with my own eyes. We're no longer in a world of scarcity. We are in a world of wealth. So we need a new philosophy. We don't need. I love how you said today, if he was writing today, it would be the wealth of sustainable development of nations, right? Well, what I what I what I'm proposing uh, in the shorthand is the well-being of nations rather than the wealth of nations, because the basic idea of uh, the ethical underpinnings of our lives and the ethical underpinnings of economics is ethics in its true sense is not do this, do that. It's what's good for us, uh, good Mm -hmm. for us as human beings. Uh, And Aristotle, uh, who invented uh, the science of ethics, uh, said uh, ethics is the way to achieve happiness. And that's what our politics and economics should be about. Adam Smith, uh, who was also a moralist uh, and a very great humanist, He wrote The Wealth of Nations to promote wealth and uh, looked at now, we shouldn't be trapped in that concept for exactly the reason you said. But going back to 1776, it's pretty plausible as a shorthand that uh, more was really a good idea. Uh, And uh, what happened in in the history of philosophy, which I'm, uh, you know, many people have uh, sorted out and thought about is the odd part that throughout most of uh, Western history, philosophers uh, railed against uh, avarice and accumulation of wealth uh, as something that was not for the human good. But they were, in a way, speaking about uh, static economies and static societies. So Greed and uh, and accumulation was almost surely a zero sum struggle. Uh, somebody getting rich meant uh, automatically somebody getting poor. To Adam Smith's uh, basic uh, motivation in the wealth of nations, he recognized rightly that he was living at a time when you could have more without somebody having less. Uh, it didn't always work that way because a lot of accumulation was based on slavery, for example. So that was uh, really uh, a a terrible uh, case of negative sum or at least zero sum struggle. But a lot of what Smith argued and that what really came to be the case in the 19th and 20th centuries is you could have more without anybody having less because our technologies were getting smarter and smarter. But 
fast forward to where we are right now, your question is extremely pertinent for many, many reasons. One is the idea that, well, there's an endless frontier to accumulate. That's wrong. We've reached our limits. We've reached mm -hmm. physical limits. We're destroying the planet by what we're doing right now. Yeah. That was not the case 200 years ago. We didn't really understand, of course. Well, we did understand, I should emphasize, by the way, as uh, early as uh, 1896, scientists understood that the fossil fuel age had this twist to it, that it was going to start to warm the planet. They didn't mm -hmm. necessarily realize uh, in that first inkling uh, that this was going to be a huge danger, but already we've known for decades that's a kind of planetary boundary that more is not good. We just have bad accounting right now. We think we're getting wealthy. We're actually destroying the planet. So that's one part. But the second part is maybe in a way, I don't want to overdo it, but you could justify avarice and greed if it leads to accumulation that adds to a, a bigger pie that eases uh, this uh, uh, scarcity that humanity has suffered for so long. But today, uh, it's clearly not the case that it's absolutely vital for the United States to add the next percent of GDP. That's absurd. We have so much wealth. I mean, by the way, <laughs> even... <laughs> unimaginable amounts of uh, individual wealth. Uh, and we have the ability to solve our problems of deprivation. It's actually, in a way, our ethos, which is blocking us more than anything right yes. now, because our ethos of uh, rugged individualism or uh, get what you can, uh, which may have made sense in the age of accumulation of wealth is highly detrimental now when our problem is not wealth, our problem is social connectedness, our problem is uh, ability to cooperate with each other, the uh, need for trust with each other. Our, our society, sad to say in the United States, is falling apart. And one of the reasons it's falling apart actually is that our ethics right now are really for a different era. Uh, we need, we need, and one of the things I'm arguing is we need to go back to Aristotle, to Jesus's teachings, to other uh, uh, ancient wisdom ethics, because they were about social connectedness. They were about justice. They yeah. were about uh, deeper meaning than wealth. Maybe, again, just to uh, <laughs> beat it uh, dead, you could uh, excuse the focus on wealth accumulation if you are able thereby to escape from poverty. But we long ago escaped from poverty. Really, our challenge of a good life is something very different. And the fact that the United States simply cannot solve any major problem right now. We can't stop a pandemic. We can't face our uh, profound uh, social inequalities in an honest way. We can't make a budget that is decent for the common good. All of this is a sign of something wrong with our ethics more than anything else. It's not wrong with our wealth creating mechanisms. It's something about how we view our role in the world. Mm -hmm. To bring it back to the book, geography, technology, institutions are about ideas, about how we organize our lives, about the philosophy that we live by. And we need, because we are in a new age right now, we need a new ethics that is still true to human well-being and human nature, but at least is up to date with planetary realities. What are those? That we're global? that we're interconnected, that it doesn't, that we are not the, the be all and end all of the planet, one country, one race, one uh, anything. We are 7.8 billion people really packed together tightly now. And wealth accumulation is not our major struggle by far. So 
I mean, I want to ask you a million questions. It's that my job is very hard today because there's so much here. Um, I have to say, I, I think it was all the way back in chapter one of the book ish, um, where you quote Weber and you talk about you're starting, you talk about institutions and political institutions, political rules, and how there's this very deep connection with once how once the state is organized, it has a quote, monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force. I mean, it took my breath away because I've read this stuff before, but not right now, given the context, right? Given what we are just watching unfold around us with Black Lives Matter, with this global conversation happening right now about the abuses of police force. So a theme that I love that you, that you bring up again and again in the book and that you're talking about a little bit now is look look back to go forward, right? To, to be able to know what to do next and how to solve some of our problems. So in, it can be a, Mike, you can take, take your pick here, but <laughs> part of me wants to ask on this particular issue, right? Was there a time in which you think force power and the, and the connection that it has uh, with the formation, the organization of a state, right? Of a, of a community, if I can be that touchy feely about it. No. At, are there other times that you think of that you think it was done better than here's how we could do it better now, looking to that example? Kind of one right. way I want to ask about it. But in general, if you want to make it a broader theme, go oh. for it. Um, this is your this is your show. Uh, as you think about the ethics that are so lacking today, I know given you can't, you can't just go pull what worked at one period in time and recycle it and use it again now, but what can we look where can we look for inspiration? What can we borrow? What can we adapt? When did it work best? Did, do you think? <laughs> when were the ethics in line with the reality of the world in which people were living? When, when, uh, when uh, Weber talks about uh, the state as the, uh, the, the place of uh, the uh, monopoly of uh, the legitimate monopoly of force, uh, he's not really saying that uh, the state has uh, um, uh, the right to use force or that the state is based on force, but he is saying that uh, the state uh, does not, should not face competition for legitimate force. Uh, and uh, it, it's really a claim about what can make for a peaceful society. Now, in what context could the state be uh, the locus of legitimate force or power uh, and things work out well for the the people in that society yeah. uh, that question is the age-old question of politics and probably the best answer to it just like the best answer to ethics was given in the first book of political science ever written by aristotle uh, in the politics uh, and that was uh, 2,300 years ago, roughly. What I love about Aristotle's view of politics is that he says it's self-evident that what is politics? Politics is about the action of the community for the good of the people in the community. Uh, the Greek idea of the good is eudaimonia. Uh, and the idea of politics is to organize the polis, the city-state of, uh, of uh, Aristotle's time, for the eudaimonia of the people. What a wonderful idea. And how far it is from our idea of politics right now. Yeah. Our idea of politics uh, is uh, much closer to Machiavelli's idea, written uh, in, uh, I think, first manuscript form in 1514, that 500 years ago that I mentioned uh, as being such a dramatic time. Machiavelli, uh, by the way, was deeply steeped in classical uh, philosophy uh, and uh, was a wonderful historian and scholar. But he wrote uh, what we know of as a very cynical handbook that views politics as power. Politics is a game. It's a game of power. Uh, and the prince should do what the prince needs to do to hold on to power. Uh, it's a very bleak picture. Uh, and uh, it is unfortunately a closer picture to American politics right now than 
uh, Aristotle's vision of politics as being the way that uh, a political community uh, pursues the common good uh, and pursues happiness. Uh, so uh, what Machiavelli gave us was something rather uh, dark. Now, <laughs> interestingly, uh, of course, our roots uh, of uh, political thinking uh, follow uh, the British line of thinking. Uh, and Hobbes, uh, in writing uh, uh, in the midst of uh, the English civil wars of the middle of the 17th century, has the idea that what human beings need is kind of a Weberian monopoly of power, which Hobbes calls the Leviathan. Uh, he was writing at a time of civil war, and for him, absolutely the highest aspiration was not happiness. In fact, he didn't really believe in happiness. He believed that people were insatiably pursuing fame uh, and insatiably pursuing wealth, so they couldn't have any happiness. They were inevitably colliding with each other. And Hobbes said in a state of nature, they'd kill each other. Uh, life would be uh, short and brutish. So Hobbes said the only way to stop people from doing damage to each other uh, was to have an all-powerful state. Now, the point I, I like to emphasize is that Aristotle had a much brighter picture of uh, human beings. He didn't have a fuzzy-headed idea that humanity was all good and it was all touchy-feely and uh, we all love each other. Uh, he had the idea that uh, there were two sides of human nature. Uh, for him, a kind of uh, animalistic, instinctual nature and a higher nature, which was based on our unique capacity to reason. So Aristotle said that uh, humankind's highest calling was cultivation of reason, uh, that as a reasoning being, that was our telos, that was our purpose. And he believed that we could live in a civil society, we could live as political animals in the polis, in uh, the city-state, peacefully, uh, if we would restrain our animalistic side and promote our rational side. And he said that uh, politics should be about instruction in virtue, in well-being. We should teach good manners. We should teach sociability. We should teach self-restraint. We should teach the idea of the common good. Uh, we should teach the virtues, is how uh, the Greeks uh, put it, uh, arete, or the excellences of character. Uh, and that has a lot of appeal to me, uh, actually. So uh, Hobbes is a very bleak picture. Machiavelli is a very cynical picture. Aristotle is a, a very realistic picture, in my mind, of the two sides of uh, human nature. Now, for Aristotle, it was a little bit easier. Uh, he lived in Athens. He actually had to flee Athens for his life. Uh, uh, it, it was not so simple. He knew the world wasn't so simple. But what do we do in this global world? 7.8 billion people. And humanity is not touchy-feely that we all love each other. It's, uh, uh, it is uh, nice to think but it's not so easy to realize even within our communities, much less across the world. Mm -hmm. So I think part of our really big practical challenge is, can we find a common ethical base for pursuing the common good that overcomes what is, I believe, an instinctive, uh, even evolutionarily built in uh, us versus them mentality that contributes to our instinctive nature, good for me, not for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I regard as uh, so much of our problem and where rationality should overcome instinct in this way. We're pretty deeply, uh, I think, hardwired uh, to uh, hate the other, unfortunately. Uh, it, it seems that that is uh, one of the outcomes of evolution uh, on the African savanna where uh, different small bands of uh, humans competed with each other for turf and for survival. Uh, and uh, we probably uh, 
uh, are an embodiment of that ancient struggle. And it, it reminds me, Jessica, of, uh, I think, a, a very important general guidepost for all of us is a, a saying of uh, my great guru in, uh, in uh, uh, evolutionary biology, E.O. Wilson at Harvard, who's one of the gifts to this world in knowledge and insight. He says, we've stumbled into the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions, mm -hmm. our medieval institutions, and our near godlike technologies. And <clears throat> what is so pertinent about this, first of all, is the interplay of human nature, uh, institutions, and technology. So we're exactly aligned on that. Right. But what, what Wilson is emphasizing is that they don't run on the same speed. Uh, and uh, we have to understand. And the more we understand, the more we can appreciate this asynchronous reality that we have some very deep and unsettling uh, ideas uh, and instincts and feelings about the world that are probably really uh, deeply part of the human species. We have institutions like our constitution, which was made in 1789, absolutely brilliant then, but I wouldn't start with a lot of it now. Uh, if we were doing it over again, it uh, has led to uh, certain pretty deep-seated problems in our country. And technology is racing ahead at the rate of Moore's Law, uh, doubling uh, every year or two. Our human nature is not doubling every year or two in understanding. Our institutions are not keeping up. Uh, and yet we're now in the digital age. I mean, that quote, it's like you couldn't have designed it better to line up. I loved I loved the several quotes throughout the book um, of E.O. Wilson. I, I would like, since we're a little over halfway through, I would like to look at some of the audience questions, but right. selfishly, I'm going to reserve the right to kind of weave one little part of my own question into it as well. When you talk about just now, you know, we can't go start over and rewrite the constitution, but if we would today, what would it look like? How would it be different? Knowing what we know, being who we are today. So I'm telling you again and again, I was nodding along relating to so much in the book, including to like weird stuff, stuff I didn't anticipate uh, relating to, like, for example, way, way back in the way back Paleolithic age, <laughs> talking about clans and um, these small foraging bands, I guess I should say, of 20 to 30 members. I'm thinking, that's like the size of my quarantine pot almost. There you are. <laughs> and, I was, and I was thinking like, what can I learn? What can I learn from how they did things? What was working, what wasn't? I feel like in a lot of ways, this strange moment with COVID is allowing us to, in a very personal way, all of us take a breath and sort of um, rebuild, you know, kind of the way that we interact with the world, right? So with that, my selfish sort of thread in that, in this next question, one of our audience members is asking, saying disease and, diseases and pandemics have shaped history, of course, smallpox, smallpox, bubonic plate, et cetera. And you, you go through a lot of those. How do you think the COVID pandemic right now will reshape or could reshape the future? Yeah, we, we are uh, uh, being reminded of uh, all sorts of things. Uh, before I get to COVID, I, I actually wanted to uh, just uh, encourage all of us to think uh, about that question, what would we do in political design? Because I think it's actually a very interesting question. I just wanted to mention a couple of thoughts about that and then turn yeah. to uh, turn to the pandemic. Um, I would definitely not have a president. This is the starting point. Uh, we do not need uh, this single executive, especially in the United States, that combines two roles that almost in every other decent place right now is separated, uh, which is head of state and head of government. Uh, in almost all countries now in constitutional dispensations, uh, there's either a monarch who is a constitutional monarch uh, that uh, is the head of state, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, or uh, the king and queen of Sweden, uh, and so forth. And they embody uh, a national pride, a national history, uh, and uh, don't get involved in day-to-day -day politics. Uh, 
the head of government uh, runs the uh, executive branch and is uh, typically in uh, constitutional monarchies, the prime minister now. Uh, so it's an executive that uh, is beholden to a parliament and can lose a vote of confidence, ha, which would be a really nice thing if we had that, uh, because uh, who could have confidence in uh, the nut that we have as president right now? Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody should. Uh, so uh, in our country, they had the model of the king, uh, King George. They didn't want a king, uh, although there was some flirtation with the king uh, among uh, some of the more monarchically oriented uh, of the founding fathers. Uh, but uh, they needed an executive. So they created the president uh, as both the head of state and the head of government. It's too much. It's too powerful. Uh, and uh, as the U.S. became an empire and became a, a, a globe straddling a military superpower, we invested far too much power in one person. And thanks God, most of the time, uh, the people in that position were somewhat normal or close to normal or, or even normal and sometimes gifted. Uh, uh, but uh, now we have a really, in my view, a clinical case uh, as president, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. How does he govern? Uh, he governs by executive decree almost entirely. Uh, and uh, it's one, and what we're learning, I didn't really appreciate it, uh, how many times the word emergency or national security appears throughout our national legislation giving the president extraordinary powers in what are supposed to be extraordinary circumstances. But if you have an autocrat like Trump, uh, who uh, sees everything as an emergency uh, or claims everything to be an emergency, you grab power in an unbelievable way. So this man uh, is uh, able single-handedly to do absolutely horrible things. Uh, and you have to remind uh, yourself uh, every now and then, hey, we're supposed to be a democracy. And the only thing that holds Trump back, practically speaking right now, are the courts on occasion, uh, but not systematically enough, especially since he's appointed 200 judges uh, that uh, are going to have a very, very uh, typically pro-executive power outlook. So this is where I would start. But I'd also like to raise another uh, idea because I hope that people listening online will take it forward uh, better. In 1789, not everyone, of course, could uh, go to Washington. So we had the idea of republicanism, of representative government, uh, partly out of uh, uh, a normative thought that representatives would be specialists trained in politics, uh, trained in legislation, and out of the practical point that somebody had to decide, uh, and in a country spread out along the Atlantic seaboard, uh, it couldn't be uh, the, uh, the self-governance of uh, Swiss cantons. Uh, we were larger than that already back in 1789. It would have to be representatives taking a long journey uh, to uh, a, a single location to do the business of the nation, and that became Washington. Well, now we easily interact. Uh, I really kind of wonder about the role of Congress also. So I, I'd like to get rid of the president, presidency. I, I uh, wonder <laughs> what we really need representatives for exactly. Now, the argument against direct democracy is about its. Uh, uh, potentially radical and dangerous nature, swings of whim, uh, and so forth. So arguments of, uh, against direct democracy uh, date back uh, to before uh, Aristotle's time, actually, and were already uh, discussed by Aristotle at length. Uh, and the idea of government by the demos was uh, the people was already a, a, a charged idea. So I don't necessarily mean uh, the, the downsides, but I wonder what could we do through truly online uh, group activities 
why should legislation be written in the middle of the night by corporate lobbyists rather than being posted and worked on like a Wikipedia page, uh, which is uh, actually on average a remarkably good uh, source of information. I don't know how exactly it doesn't get distorted more often, but it's a pretty darn reliable source of information for an unbelievable amount of entries. What if we worked on legislation, on police reform or any other topic as a society? Uh, People could post their essays, their expertise. We could have witnesses that the whole country sees. Uh, We could have people uh, propose uh, uh, phrasing uh, ideas and approaches uh, that uh, the rest of us could uh, weigh in on, uh, I think we would find ways to express the common good vastly more effectively than we do now. And uh, I'm, in general, a technophile uh, and a techno-optimist, although the whole book is filled with the fact that you can militarize anything under the sun. Uh, including obviously uh, artificial intelligence and online, and every day we're filled with the debates about that. But I am in general a believer that uh, the new technology should allow for an e-governance in a way that we haven't had before. And I'd like to get on with some attempts at that and some experimentation uh, at the national level, certainly at the state and local level, to uh, try to demonstrate the case. Now, that segues into COVID-19. First, we don't know how long this disease is going to last and how uh, deeply it is going to uh, uh, disrupt societies for two reasons. If one of the hundred or so vaccines that's uh, under development now really proves to be highly effective, that will truncate the the pandemic. And uh, let's hope that that's the case. Uh, I would say the most optimistic views about that are hype rather than reality that, uh, you know, within a couple of months, uh, you could uh, immunize billions of people. We would never know the safety of what we're doing uh, on such an approach. And it would be a a reckless rush to uh, do something like that. So it's going to take time. But what it could also prove to be the case, uh, as it has been with HIV, uh, that uh, we had a Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services in 1983, Margaret Heckler, who said, we're going to have a vaccine by the fall. uh, And that was uh, 37 years ago. And we don't have a vaccine in sight. So we don't even know whether there will ever be a vaccine, much less what's uh, claimed and hyped uh, in 2021. Now, saying that, there's a lot about the virus we don't know, and we're not controlling it also. And American society is proving to be pretty damn obstreperous and difficult. Uh, And uh, we even politicize face masks. Are you kidding? What is wrong with this country that face masks became a left right issue? It's, of course, in large part because we have a excuse me for saying it, but I believe a psychopath is president uh, who has uh, basically uh, created uh, as much hate and division as he possibly can as his mode of behavior and mode of governing. But we're a very difficult country right now that we can't even physically distance, wear a face mask, and keep this under control. And it's become a matter of fundamental rights as if people have a fundamental right to cough on someone or to spread a virus. And people are apparently not much aware that the face mask is first and foremost a protection to other people, not even to yourself. So it's just good etiquette. It's yeah. just good decency. Of course, it's also self-protective as well. Now, what I'm seeing, you know, watching the data as uh, others are, so many countries in the world are absolutely not controlling this virus. And uh, a lot of them are ruled by Trumplets, uh, like Brazil. Uh, Bolsonaro is a horrible president, actually, uh, with all of the instincts of Trump, nationalistic, uh, anti-science, lots of bravado, terrible examples, 
Uh, and uh, Brazil is having a fulminant runaway pandemic right now. Mexico, with its own populist leader, uh, is having a runaway epidemic right now. So this is the next point that I would say how deep and transformative this is depends on how we act, because this is a controllable virus, but we're not controlling it. How do I know it's controllable? Because China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand have all controlled it. Not perfectly, but they have such a few cases that when the inevitable new outbreaks come, they're able to contain them, to suppress them. So if the whole world behaved that way with rationality, with cooperation, with exchange of best practices, we'd be over this in three months uh, because each place would suppress the epidemic. We would then bolster that control with uh, public health teams, testing, monitoring, and we'd get through this. But we're not doing that. So that's the the next peculiar reality. This is going to be painful because governance is so lousy right now in so many places, including our own country. Then the longer this goes on, the more threats to basic world order. People are suffering. Uh, Poor people are out of jobs. Uh, They've lost remittance income. Uh, They're losing uh, their ability to stay uh, in perhaps uh, countries uh, where uh, they are uh, working on uh, visas or temporary stays. So there are a lot of crises that are building up, a lot of financial pressures, a lot of uh, debts of uh, the public sector in almost every country in the world. The failure to control the virus means that we're deepening the economic impacts and the shadow that this will have on the future. Two more points I would make. The Asia Pacific on average has done vastly better than the North Atlantic. So the North Atlantic means us and Canada and Mexico on the Western side of the Atlantic, and it means Western Europe uh, on the other side. And by and large, all of us, the rich, advanced, sophisticated countries failed to suppress the epidemic early on. And many of the countries, notably the US and the UK, uh, as two of uh, those countries with similar politics right now, are still in an ongoing wave of infection. In the Asia Pacific, as I mentioned earlier, most of the countries have suppressed the virus. And they've done it in a pretty sophisticated manner, actually, with a lot of digital technologies, a lot of creativity, a lot of know-how, and a lot of much tighter social organization, a Confucian culture, I would say, rather than uh, I get to do whatever I want culture uh, Mm -hmm. of, uh, of America. So this means that the geopolitics is really uh, pushing uh, even the faster rise of the East Asia. Uh, and that already was a mark of this new age of globalization. We're past the, uh, the American century. We are into a multipolar world where East Asia plays a larger and larger role. Very complicated set of issues because East Asia is Uh, not so harmonious uh, amongst themselves. But if they looked at what's happening right now, they'd say, hey, we can cooperate together. We don't know what's happening on the other side of the world, but at least we have the epidemic under control. The last point about this epidemic, obviously, is that it has pushed us headlong into the, the digital economy, a trend that was completely underway, but in 12 weeks has accelerated Uh, to what might have taken five to 10 years otherwise. How many businesses have I talked to, and I'm sure everyone has this experience, where people said, oh my God, I didn't realize we could do 80% of our work from home. We're never going to go back to the office the way we were before. Mm -hmm. This is happening everywhere. Uh, And uh, it means that the jobs of the future 
are absolutely changing before our eyes in a way that only a mega war would have done in the past. Within a few weeks, we're redefining the workplace. Uh, right. We're redefining the office. We're redefining uh, uh, how we interact, how we work together, how teams work together, uh, how government provides services, uh, how we uh, expect uh, our goods to arrive. Mind you, of course, it's a cliche. All of this was happening beforehand, but the acceleration of it uh, has uh, made people realize uh, the tools that we have. Now, in general, I like it. Uh, I, I don't like not being able to go in to see colleagues, but you know, one or two days a week is going to be fine with me, not five days a week. It already was fine with me mm -hmm. before. And uh, I think if we make something good of this, uh, we can make for more leisure time, for less commuting time, for more quality interactions when we are together. But we should understand that uh, it has created an unbelievable amount of inequality as well in a short period of time. People with online uh, applicable skills have their jobs, they have their incomes, they have their daily routines, they have their Zooms uh, from morning till night. Uh, people who are working in shops, doing uh, local services, frontline responders, and so forth, uh, have uh, lost incomes, have faced infections, uh, don't have uh, the luxuries of the generally much higher paid workers, and uh, don't have an easy answer right now. And uh, a lot of people have lost their wealth. And on the other hand, uh, uh, Jeffrey Bezos uh, has uh, gained about $50 billion in net worth since the start of the year. So these are real issues for our society going forward. I hear you. I mean, it's a it was a fantastic question and I'm glad that it was asked and I'm glad that it was answered. And I can't believe this and I hate to do it, but our our time is just about over. Um, you know, I wanted to cite one thing as we close. There was, I, I guess it was in the classical age section of the book, you talked about how there was this awareness, this consciousness that the participants themselves felt that they were writing the history of humanity. And I felt like that maybe above um, so much else, that that for me is something I'm going to take away and that I hope we can all take away, that, that that's actually a truth all the time for all of us. <laughs> and I, my hope is that conversations like this, the more people that get their book in your hands and can think through these ideas with you, um, the more we can come back to that awareness. So thank, thank you. you so much, Jessica. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, it's been an honor to talk with you today. So our thanks on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, our thanks to you, Jeffrey Sachs, author of the new book, The Ages of Globalization, for joining us today. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club uh, in making virtual, virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Jessica Jackley. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. <laughs>